Hello and welcome to episode 155 of Prose. This week, meet a woman with magic in her voice. While you listen, please consider heading to prosepodcast.com, our one-stop shop for all things prose. There you can find links to social media, the episodes, a shop for swag, the show's Patreon, and more. On social media, like and share away, and say hello. Most importantly, please do consider subscribing, rating, or reviewing wherever you grab your podcasts. Thank you for listening. Let's get to the tale, shall we? This week, we have Even Vixen's Ache, or Lessons Learned from the Life of an Enchantress. Enjoy. Even Vixen's Ache, or Lessons Learned from the Life of an Enchantress. Humbly in honor and awe of the talent of and in thanks and appreciation for the personage of Miss Eva Noblezada. All right, folks. Thanks for all the great energy out there tonight. I'm here to announce for you the star of the show, the reason why you all braved a sub-zero winter night and are here sipping cocktails and noshing on truffle fries. Please welcome to the Elevation Stage, the brilliant, the beautiful, the voice that moves, Miss Rosa Briantes. Rosa never quite knew how to feel when the MC announced her as Rosa. Depending on the announcer for any given evening's background, she generally became Rosita, in the case of many Spanish speakers, Rose, in the case of many English speakers, or any other number of permutations given the diversity of New York City and its cocktail bar's talent introducing hosts. Herman, Tonight's host could at least get Rosa out instead of the fully anglicized Rose. It was never Rosas, though. She'd long ago dropped the last S, seeing as, despite all the linguistic and cultural diversity, no one ever got the Tagalog right. In fairness, her own mortal father originally from Nuevo León, Estados Unidos Mexicanos, took to calling her Rosita himself. And he was the one that signed the birth certificate with the extra S. His was a nickname. Everyone else just couldn't seem to wrap their minds around a Filipino name. No matter. Tonight, she would go out and dazzle as she always did. It wasn't arrogance or hyperbole or speaking something into existence. It just was. Rosas had worked hard to get where she was. That could not be argued. However, her hard work was equivalent to many other of her peer singers and entertainers out on the streets of Manhattan. And she was head and shoulders above their abilities despite being significantly younger and head and shoulders smaller than most of her peers. Her slight stature had no effect on her abilities though, that is for sure. She might have been 100 feet tall for how she could belt to the point of hurting ears, should she choose to give a note all of her might. Rosas had worked hard to get where she was, but Unbeknownst to all of her show business peers, she had also had a little help from the realm of the supernatural.
It wasn't until her 26th birthday that she found out from her father and mother that her mother wasn't completely human. She was close, but not entirely. As it turned out, her mother's mother had been a rather powerful Luinri, a magical being from the Philippines that inhabited the nation's many thousands of islands, blending in with the peoples, cultures, and languages thereof. The Luinri were not necessarily wholly benign, but they were generally kind to their human neighbors, loving to interact with them with their true mystical nature disguised. Most often, the Luinri would appear in liminal times, when the world was on the edge of night or day. Dawn, noon, sunset, midnight. They loved those spaces where one thing became another. When they did choose to shed their disguise and appear to a traveler or local resident, the Luinri would sing. They'd sing like something not of this earth. Their songs would sound like laughter, crying, joy, desolation. It all depended on the receiver. The humble and kind would receive love and beauty like nothing a mortal could ever imagine. The proud and venomous would hear nothing but shrillness and pain, hearing the suffering and toxicity they projected out into the world, echoing back to them 10,000 fold. Being as powerful as they were, Lewinry could easily skew this at will, choosing to give all beauty or all terror to any given receiver. But they most often chose to allow the listener's own spirit to determine what kind of song they would receive when they were given the gift of a Lewinry visit. Rosas' family tradition went that her grandfather, Amado Ocampo, traveling from Bugasong to the commercial bastion of Cebu City, came upon a beautiful Lorinri in the moonlight. At first, he had thought he had just happened upon a stunning woman in need of help out in the countryside northwest of Iloilo. So, being the kind and generous man he was, he stopped to help this person in need. Before he realized it, the Lewinry had shed its glamour and revealed herself to him in all of her glory, starting a song that, because Amato had a clear head and loving heart, was something the likes of which humanity had rarely seen or heard or experienced or felt. Beauty unparalleled, crystalline joy. Even the Lewinry herself began to weep at her song, reflected back to her because of the power and purity of Amato's heart. After her singing simply became too overwhelming a joy, the Lewinry put back on her glamour that allowed her to move among the humans, and Rosas' grandparents decided to travel together, the Lewinry choosing to go with Amato on his journey. As if the song and Amato's goodness weren't enough for the Lewinry, the two immediately hit it off personally as they continued to Iloilo and then on across the islands and straits to Cebu City. There, without hesitation, the two decided to marry, something unheard of among the Lewinry. Upon their elopement, the bride revealed that her name that she used among humanity was Bituin, which was only fitting, for Amato had met her under the stars and she would come to become his guiding light for the rest of his days. Bituin and Amado Ocampo chose to settle just outside of Rojas, raising a large and loving family. Rosas' own mother was one of 12 children, six boys and six girls. Most of her uncles and aunties on her mother's side were back in the Philippines, though most of them had been unable to resist the inertia of Manila leaving Rojas and the surrounding countryside behind upon coming of age. But her mother had always been one for even greater adventure. 
So she chose to go and study in the United States under the watchful eyes of some far-flung cousins. California State University in Long Beach became her new home in short order, and she began her studies. The Lewinry powers were there in her, but she never really made use of them. Save on karaoke nights with her girlfriends from school. After graduating from CSULB with a degree in medical technologies, she met an up-and-coming young architect, fell utterly in love, they married within months, and they had four children of their own in quick succession. So, Rosas, born of a daughter of the Lewinry, was one quarter nymph of song herself. Her mother had sat her down and explained very early on to her that, when she sang, she needed to be aware of how she was feeling, who she was around, and how they reacted. Rosas had loved singing from a very early age, so her mother felt compelled to warn her that she might have these gifts passed down through Lola Ocampo. Rosas had received the message well and tried to remember her need to control her own heart when singing, especially in front of strangers. The powers from her Lola were strong, though, far stronger than what her mother could muster on those still popular family karaoke nights. Rosas quickly came to realize that the beauty of her voice and the power of expression set her free and it also brought jubilation to all those who heard it. Unless she was in pain, or racked with sadness, of course. But even then, Rosas' singing was cathartic for those listening. They all would weep together openly as she sang those sad songs on those sad days, and they would feel better, lighter, more human, and more connected for having done so. There was power in shared emotion. There was healing. Her voice had carried her all over the world at this point, as she prepared to walk out on the stage at that little lounge five stories up in Midtown called Elevation. She had graced stages across the globe. Sydney, Paris, Doha, Los Angeles, London, Copenhagen, Moscow, Rome, Abuja, Lima, Toronto, Manila, and so many more. She'd begun checking off all the boxes to a storied career before she was even legally old enough to drink in the United States. Amid all this success, she had received praise beyond her wildest dreams. She was called a songstress, an enchantress, a diva, a voice like no other, a vixen of the stage, a once-in-a-generation talent. She always hated when they called her a siren, though. Sirens were overtly dangerous and, more often than not, hostile knowingly using their songs as weapons against the world. They sometimes even sang the winds themselves into a frenzy, meaning that even if a wayward passing sailor could resist their music, the sirens could still ensure these people's deaths by kicking up a tempestuous windstorm. Because of her aversion to the label, She'd become rather obsessed with the old Greek and proto-Greek legends about the sirens. Though she had always and likely would always chafe at the designation, Rosas had come to appreciate the human ideas behind the legend. Those ideas were maybe a bit closer to what she and her Lola really were and what they were really capable of. Some of the original words that eventually came to be marred and blackened into this long popularized mythos of sirens were words like rope, join, entangle, bind, cord, knotter, 
Weaver and others. It was easy for her to see how these words came together to make a myth of danger that propagated fear. But she knew from her own experience that her singing did join people together, allowing for their lives to entangle if but for a while. She bound her audiences to a feeling, a moment, pushing them to forget the tumult of the world outside and try to explore the richer, neglected inner worlds that everyone carries around but few choose to nurture. For tonight's performance at Elevation, Rosas was wearing all black, her top sheer and showing more skin than her father would probably like, her slacks pressed with care and her shoes more sensible than sexy. Stilettos would not do, though she did enjoy a spiky shoe. She'd be on her feet nonstop for the next two hours, after all. Her earrings were deep violet, bordering on black with small flecks of opaline white, the iridescence catching the light any time she moved her head in the slightest. To most, her outfit was just the kind of thing that a professional singer might wear on any cocktail lounge or upscale pub stage anywhere in the city on any given night. But she could smile knowing that the violet, black, and white was in honor of her Lola Ocampo and her Lewinry heritage. Her set list, though, was all her own. It was representative of who she was, who she is, who she sought to be. It contained a smattering of pop throwbacks from her childhood, classic oldies, even older, more classic oldies, and a number from a musical or two that meant the world to her. She very decidedly avoided singing the songs that had made her famous upon the boards in the Paris Opera House, West End Stages, and glitzy walks of Broadway. Those were working, Rosas. This was the weaver of lives, Rosas, the enchantress, Rosas. She was singing for herself tonight, and she would bind her life to those of the hundred or so people here in elevation. Her voice would help them soar, bring them to despondency, coax them to love, allow them to grieve, invigorate them, inspire them. Her voice would be an affirmation. Her voice would be an indictment. Her voice would be a mantra. Her voice would be a challenge. They would meditate together on the human condition, living a lifetime in a couple hours span. She would ignite the full range of these people's emotions warming them up from the January cold and the far more pervasive freeze that is modernity's grip on the human heart and human experience. Again, this was not arrogance or hyperbole or speaking something into existence. It just was. Tonight wouldn't just be about song. She would bear her soul to these people through speaking as well. Rosas was always keen to tell her audiences of her very real, very tumultuous struggles since finding early fame. There was nothing magical about the personal and psychological battles she waged against the darker voices that tried to whisper their way into the forefront of her thoughts every day. Years of self-discovery hit or miss therapy, and some important texts had helped Rosas quiet these voices. But they had not been caged away permanently or banished entirely from her thoughts. Don Miguel Ruiz's The Four Agreements, a practical guide to personal freedom, a Toltec wisdom book, 
informed some of her first and most effective mantras to employ against the disquiet that tried to consume her. Rosas might be blessed with some magic, but she was entirely human. The struggle she faced had no easy spell that could counter or dissipate them. So, she did the work. As such, she wanted to let her fans know that this was the case, to let them know that her life and her world were not some crystal palace that served as both a flawless, enviable bauble to observers and bulwark against the tribulations that all must endure. In truth, in her quarter century of life, she had lived an accelerated life, thanks to the success and the fame, and the entertainment had a way of magnifying those tribulations in depth and volume. Rosas, bordering on 26 years old, was an old soul then. Her empathic nature served to enhance that wise beyond her years nature. Put it all together, and she had carried such burdens as many might know in five lifetimes. But she endured. She thrived in the face of the bleakness and disheartenment. She succeeded, not thanks to any mystical blood coursing through her, but through her own hard work, diligence, and perseverance, all of which were ongoing, never ending, and part of a conscious effort of will that was nothing short of Herculean. She had to tell her story in full. Rosas knew that her audiences, young and old alike, needed to know that even those that weave magic for them suffer and must strive against being overcome by the darkness. She owed them this. She also owed her Lola this, her whole family really. Kuwintuhan was a long tradition on her mother's side, and her father's Mexicano traditions embraced the power of storytelling and story sharing just as tightly. Rosas often thought of what might have become of her had she not had all the love in her life. Unlike many other people in the world, she had loving parents and siblings. Her abuelo, abuela, Lolo and Lola all lifted her up like only the best grandparents can. La Winry Heritage or no, what saved her and stilled her against the onslaught of the world was this familial love. Through that love, she'd grown to know how to love others. Her closest friends now acted as fortifications built upon this already solid foundation. When the storms raged, these loves are what kept her aright. Her mother and father's belief in her and adoration of her were always evident to her right there in her full name. Rosas Alegria Briantes. Rose, joy, brightness. Clearly, as the oldest, her parents had told the universe that this little one would be the light of their lives. This was a lot to live up to, but it was also a constant reminder of who and what she was to her family. Her name itself was a safe space for her, and she often used it as a refuge from the bustle of her performative life. All of this in a moment. Herman intoned her introduction, and in the time it took him to do so, and for her to swing her right leg out to take the first step into the light and onto the stage, Rosas had spent an eternity in herself, traversing her heritage, her past, and her present. She had battled down the turmoil and the demons that plagued her. She had lived a lifetime of what-ifs. 
Every time she performed, she did this. Her entire being came into sharp focus. It was akin to what all those stories about near-death experiences that she liked to watch on the Travel Channel described. One's entire being laid bare in the space of a breath. It was time. Time for her to go out and reawaken these people who would look to her with open eyes but closed hearts. It was her job to open them back up to feeling, to tear down the walls and defenses that they had all long since built up to keep them safe from the ravages of everyday life. She would do just that with her tirelessly trained, Lewinry enhanced voice. And she would weave them all together, knotting and tying them into a raw shared intimacy that would remind them what it's like to be human without the lidocaine of cynicism, hopelessness, and loss. She would make them all believe in themselves again, even as she sought to fully believe in herself. There on stage, with the baby grand and joined by her pianist for the night, five floors up in Midtown Manhattan. There, in a humble by comparison cocktail bar that smelled of fried appetizers and spilled tequila called Elevation. There at the death of January and cusp of the birth of February, an in-between place if ever there were one, there, with roughly 100 hearts loudly beating into a cacophonous thrumming. There, with 188 eyes staring toward entertainment and 12 eyes staring in need of hope and unbreaking. There, basking in a love of her. Rosa said, Take us away, Andrew. And the piano began to move. The crowd surged its approving babble, then fell to silence. And she began to intone her first song, one of bittersweet love lost, one of melancholia, And Rosas set about resurrecting the spirits of her fellow man. Thank you for listening to Even Vixen's Ache or Lessons Learned from the Life of an Enchantress. As a quick reminder, this is, again, humbly in honor and awe of the talent of and in thanks and appreciation for the personage of Miss Eva Noblezada. If you are unfamiliar with her work, you should go check out any of the songs that she has sung upon over her career. My favorites come from Miss Saigon, Les Miserables, and of course, her current production, Hades Town. Thank you so much, Miss Noblezada, for the inspiration for us all. Well, that does it for prose this week. All music you have heard throughout episode 155 comes from YouTube's Royalty Free Library. The track backing today's story is Fluidscape by Kevin McLeod and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. Our next full episode will come out in two weeks' time, so please consider sharing the podcast with someone you think might enjoy these bi-weekly journeys together in advance of that new set of tales. And as you continue about your day, I hope that you'll remember to love those around you, tell them that you do, and embrace this life as it is always stranger than fiction. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>